2020 was a bit of a crazy year for all of us, wasn't it, with COVID and yeah, all the things that I'd had planned for the year just sort of fell by the wayside. One good thing was I got to fish quite a lot at Horton, which is my kind of home water, and haven't really got to fish there in the spring over the last few years because I've been away filming and whatnot. Um, the upside was I had a really lovely spring and summer fishing there, and come autumn though, I was kind of ready for a bit of a change, a bit of a new challenge, and uh, it came about that we'd been invited to film over on the Woolpack. Say the name Woolpack, and most carp hangs will associate it with big old carp and indeed you know it's got some quite historic fish in it it's a historic venue yeah it was uh, it was too tempting and often not to take up however it was quite late in the year with my first trip it was actually mid-november um, so i turned up really at the end of at the end of the activity for the year just as the lake was shutting down and i did a four day session and i blanked so i didn't really turn up at the right time to to maybe um take advantage but what it did do was kind of sow the seed in my mind you know this lake five and six which I'm fishing on is, uh, is an incredible lake it's about the carpiest lake that I've ever ever fished really it's got it all it's really interesting so I was really had it in my mind that I had a score to set all come spring I fished it a couple more times after that trip I really sort of wanted to maybe try and bag one but at least you know get a little bit of homework in for the following year it was Mother Nature in the end that called a halt to proceedings. Uh, the whole area flooded around Christmas and it wasn't fishable again for another couple of months. I had it in the back of my mind the whole time though and sort of come April I was really, really keen to get back. However, I had a couple of work commitments pop up and actually couldn't really get down here as much as I wanted. Come May though, the weather's starting to warm up a little bit. You know, we didn't have a great spring, but the days are getting longer, the fish are waking up and I just knew I had to get down. It was early morning on the first day and I was looking out across Lake Five, just looking for some sort of sign, something to go on. And I noticed a little bit of bubbling and it took me a while to kind of, to really clock that it was a fish feeding. I stood watching it for about 10 minutes until I was really sure that it was a fish. And to me, this was a really, really good chance. You know, I've, I've caught quite a lot of carp by just poling out and dropping on the bubblers. So I really hustled, you know, I, I was excited. This was a real opportunity to maybe bag my first wall pack carp. It actually carried on fizzing while I pulled out, so I was able to drop it right in amongst the froth. And this can be, you know, it's risky, you know, you can spook them, you might get away with it. Five minutes later, I had a really big liner, so I was, I was pretty confident I'd got away with it. And less than five minutes after that, I was away. Um, just fishing the one rod where I was sure that there was a fish feeding. So quite simple fishing, you know, I would just spent the time watching, hadn't set up. Anyway, it was a, a quite exciting battle with reeds either side of the swim. Um, and when it rolled in front of me, I could see it was a pitch black common, you know, and at that point your heart's in your mouth and your knees are shaking and you know, I just really, I really wanted to get that first one under my belt, just for my confidence. Anyway, luckily it went over the net cord and I couldn't quite believe what I'd caught, you know, as I'm looking into the folds of the net, there's this dinosaur of a common, dinosaur, cloudy eyes and jet black scales with really distinctive pink tips, one on the base of the tail and one on his dorsal, which really sort of made him stand out. Anyway, an epic, epic carp, and oh, my confidence was just through the roof at that point. I, I knew I could catch him, but here it was, an original one, and this fish turned out to be one called Pink Tips, and there were pictures of this one dating back to 1987, so it had been one of the fish that was stocked in the 1970s, 45 odd years old, you know, a proper one, a great way to start my campaign. Yes, Dave, yes! <laughs> So, having put that fish back, I was on the barrow really, I didn't have any commitment to that area, and I went to find them again. And it turned out the weather was really warming up that day, and the fish had bobbed up up at the other end by the channel. And that day was really interesting, I got to see quite a lot of the lake stock, I got to see how many big fish are actually in five and six, you know, and I wasn't really kind of up to date on the stock, I'd seen pictures of a couple of them, but, you know, here there were at least 40 or 50 carp in the lake that I'd seen, and 
A lot of them were over 30 pounds. You know, there were a few smaller ones, but a lot of decent fish. One particular fish I saw that day was a common with a scar on it, and it was hanging around the mouth of the channel. And that evening, I decided to set up at that end of the lake. You know, obviously there were loads of fish there. It was a really good chance. And that evening, that fish actually rolled right over the top of one of my rods, you know, while Ollie the bailiff was stood there and we sort of both looked at each other and smiled and laughed and, you know, as you do when, when your confidence is high. The first light the following morning, that rod hooped round and after a mercifully brief battle, you know, these old ones, they don't really seem to fight as hard as the younger ones. And I could see that it was a decent common, you know, before it got anywhere near the net, but luckily it came straight into the net. It's 31.4, it's just draining a bit of water. And it was the fish that I'd seen in the channel the day before. Um, that turned out to be a fish called the Big Scar Common. Um, it was just a touch over 30 pounds, and I've been told that it hadn't been caught for two years prior to that. So that was a real result. Two bites, two originals, two 30 pounders. Couldn't have started any better. The second night I didn't actually catch one. The fish were there and I made a bit of a mistake really. I didn't fish the spot which I knew I should really because of other rods. And in the morning when I went and looked sort of in the area, it was clouded up and I saw a good fully scaled which could have been the pit four. And I knew really that I'd, I'd messed up. So I determined that I wasn't gonna make that mistake the following night. I fished just one rod and I fished it right on the money, right where I'd seen the fish feeding on a spot which I'd started to trickle a little bit of bait in. And it was a little bit deeper than the surrounding area. I could still see the bottom, it wasn't clean. And it didn't take long, just a couple of handfuls of scope bit of squid pellet and flake, and the fish had started to clear it. They started to push the weed and the silt to one side. And I knew that I needed to really have my hook bait in this spot. So the following night, I made sure, and I, I positioned it perfectly, using the pole, made sure that it was bang on the money. And the following morning, first light again, had a wrap round, crazy battle on the mouth of the channel, and I landed a mirror this time. Looking down in the net, you know, my favourite type of mirror, a linear, rolled it over. And it was, again, another fish that I'd seen in the channel a couple of times swim through, a fish called the Tiger Lynn, a mid-30. So, third bite, third 30 pounder. You know, that, that session couldn't have gone any better, and I went home absolutely buzzing. Well, my first wool pack mirror, and it's a cracker, a proper cracker. I do love a linear, especially a big one. Look at that. That will do. What an awesome carp. <laughs> Thank you, wool pack. Didn't really think it was going to happen this morning. There were less and less fish in the area. Uh, I nearly went home, nearly went home. I'm really glad I stayed though because I had one more chance and what a fish as well. Really, really, really nice one. I do love a linear, eh? Oh, well pleased with that. Well pleased. That old bushwhacker pole has really served me well this week. Third bite, third 30 pounder. I've got more than one night at my disposal. I'm still quite mobile, you know, I tend to pack away first thing in the morning and go for a walk around and have the gear on the barra. You know, I'm, I'm not one to claim a swim and sit in it. I'd much rather go and find an opportunity than wait for one. So it's quite important to be mobile. It's quite important to be able to move quickly at the drop of a hat. Power barra is an absolute godsend for that. Don't have to worry, you know, I don't have to think, oh, I'm gonna be knackered by the time I get there. You know, it makes it easy. Another trick is once I've pulled my rods out, I often put the pole away and put it back on the barrow. So 
if I decide that I'm going to move, everything's ready. I don't have a 10 minute pack away or 15 minutes putting the pole back in the bag. It's all ready to go. If you're fishing for just one bite, once you've got that one bite, you're going to move anyway. So it's massively beneficial to travel light, stay mobile and pack up as you go. You know, I try not to spread my stuff around too much, keep everything neat and tidy. Maybe not Alan Blair neat and tidy, but Ollie, Ollie Davies neat and tidy, you know, fairly organized. That is one of my favorite things about spring, I think. Listen to him going for it. Pew, pew, pew. So again, I turned up the following week. I had two nights at my disposal this time. Not quite as long, had some other stuff to do. You know, but again, two nights is a, is a real bonus for me. I was really enjoying this kind of fishing. And I turned up to an empty lake. You know, this is what makes it even better. There were no other anglers fishing. I walked into a quiet corner and straight away I saw a big fish just sat on the edge, which made me sort of stop in my tracks and sort of sidle behind the bushes. But that one is here, that linear. So if there's one that I'd like to catch, there goes one. That's a nice common. There's another one here, smaller one. Now it was a fish which I filmed that afternoon and, I, and I'd sort of done a bit of research and it turned out to be a fish called the Friendly Linear, which is well over 40 pounds. Now the Friendly Lin had a few friends around with him as well and over the course of the afternoon they were coming in and out and the fish actually did go down and feed. I'd got a rig down there at the bottom of the spot. It did go down and feed, but it didn't feed on top of my rig. Twice it tipped up, just fed for a few seconds, but I'd seen that fish in the corner. I knew that there was maybe a chance of catching it. So I sat up in the swim next door and I pulled my rigs to the margin, which they were patrolling along, and one to the mouth of the channel. Now, before I'd even got the third rod out, the mouth of the channel rod was away. Um, bit of carnage, you know, you've still got the pole out and lines everywhere, and it was really hard fighting carp. Turned out to be a, a low 20, I, I believe a stock fish, a really nice one though, a linear. And yeah, it was a great way to start. Like, I hadn't even got all three rods out and I had a bite. So I sort of carried on where I left off on my last trip. So after getting the fish back, I got the rod sorted again and it was just getting dark. Sat down, made a cup of coffee, I'd taken my first swig and I was away again on that same rod. This time I wasn't quite so lucky. The fish came up on the surface, kited a few yards, and then it absolutely erupted. Uh, took some line and the hook pulled. Um, absolutely gutted, you know. You don't want to lose any fish in the wall pack. You know, you, you don't know what it could be, but the fish that I'd seen down in that corner that day were all proper ones, they were all originals. There was a chance that it was one of those really good ones, so I was a little bit gutted. Got the rods back out, you know, it was just, just getting dark. I just about managed to get it out properly. And it was about three o'clock in the morning when that same rod went again. This time I managed to land it and it was a mid-20 original common. So another really nice one to catch. It made up a little bit for the one that I'd lost earlier. So three bites in the first few hours. I was, uh, <laughs> I was really like on cloud nine. The rest of that day when it was actually quite quiet, I set it out in the swim um, because I'd done a couple of laps and not really seen anything else worth fishing for around the lake. So. Sam was due to come up and do a bit of filming the following morning, so I sat put. About 7.30, had a sociable bite. The, the rod on the edge of the channel pulled up tight, and I hooked one which was really, really hard fighting. And I ended up calling for the guy who was fishing behind me, Alan, to come and give me a hand netting it. Um, and that turned out to be, well, it was a stockfish. It looked about mid-30. Uh, I was well pleased with that. I wasn't going to weigh it, but Ollie wanted to know how much it weighed, so we weighed it for him and it was actually 40 pounds an ounce, so I'm pretty glad I did weigh that one and we, it was a confirmed 40 pounder. I would have called it a mid 30 otherwise, you know. <laughs> mid 30 and, and held it up for the cameras and put it back. Weight's not that important to me, but yeah. And that wasn't the end of the action for the day. Put the rod back out, and it was about half an hour after I'd put it out, and I had another bite. Um, this fish came in fairly easily. 
rolled in front of the net and I could see it was jet black. And for a minute, I thought it's the wood carving, you know, which is the biggest common in here and an amazing pitch black 40 pound common. No, it's the same one, it's a recapture. Oh, it's pink tips again. Is it? Yeah. I'd caught this fish eight days previously um, and it meant so much to me then. Isn't carp fishing funny? And here I was like gutted to catch it. You know, once you've caught them once, you don't want to catch them again so soon. But uh, whatever I was doing was really working because here was a fish that gets caught once a year normally and it was in the bottom of my net again. Anyway, I didn't get it out. Dave Robinson had done me some really good photos the previous week. So I literally lifted it over the net, net cord just to show Sam more than anything else because he was, he was in awe of it. It's an incredible carp, you know, really one of a kind and sent it on its way. A crazy morning, two bites, but it wasn't over. Got the rods back out and hooked another one about an hour later. Carnage. So I left for home with a bit of mixed emotion really. I bagged three, I'd had a 40 pounder, I'd had an original common, oh, you know, I'd had a quick bite, you know, it was all, it was a really exciting session, but in the back of my mind I'd also lost two. And knowing what swims in these waters now, you know, with hindsight I'd really, I'd really like for them not to fall off, but you can't win them all. Can't win them all. I think spring's got to be my favourite time of year, isn't it? Especially after a long, hard winter. You know, it's when you, uh, I don't know, I think I'm, I'm not really a very good winter angler. I really rely on being able to see the carp, so when you get that first sighting in the spring, it's such an exciting moment. It's a bit of a, a portent, a promise of things to come, of better times ahead. I like it when the water clears up, you know, often in, in the spring, you have this surge of weed growth and the water goes tap, tap clear, and it really allows you to see into the carp's world. You can see where they feed, you can see where they visit. You know, they're, they're very good actually, at sometimes hiding their presence, but they can't always hide where they've been. When they've been visiting an area, They'll often clear the bottom. There'll be subtle traces that the carp have actually been there. So it allows me to go about my angling the way I like to fish for them, which is to be able to find them, to be able to, you know, almost mug them off, you know, set a little trap in the edge or find where they're feeding discreetly. It's very much about not baiting and waiting for them, but trying to get a quick bite, you know. And they're not always particularly hungry in the spring. They're often at good weights. The carp are often quite pumped, you know, before spawning. So in my experience, big beds of bait mass baiting isn't always the way to go you know just you're trying to nick a bite really you know often you watch them and they'll come in and they'll just take a couple of baits and they'll mooch off and they might come back and take a couple of baits and mooch off so if you're fishing over a lot of bait it's quite difficult to get a bite for me it's definitely a time to set traps bright pop-ups work really well you know something that will catch their attention they're often a little bit muggy before the water warms up you know a little bit slower as we get into summer, I might swap those bright baits for something a little bit less conspicuous, but uh, in the spring they work really, really well. The carp really do start to get about in the spring as well. You know, you can see them at one end of the lake and then later on in the day, they might be up at the other end of the lake. So it certainly pays to spend a lot of time walking and looking. You know, that's my favorite part about it. Observation, looking, watching them. It's exciting, you know, it's exciting. I do a lot of tree climbing. I do a lot of, uh, crawling into brambly holes, looking in those little areas that other people don't necessarily look because the fish will start visiting them. And certainly on this lake here, it's one of the carpiest lakes I've ever been to. There's so many lovely little corners, so many little bushes and quiet margins and reed line margins, places where you'd expect to find carp. So yeah, it's quite exciting. Lots of places to look, lots of uh, new stuff to learn. Pole, catch, pole, catch, pole, <laughs> catch. <laughs> and that is right on, them, on the money, that spot that we've just been looking at. That's it. 
hand placed. The stock, when I started, was a little bit of a mystery to me. I kind of liked it that way. I kind of wanted to find out as I went along. And gradually I've seen fish that have been caught by other members and the ones that I've caught myself. And I think what stands out the most is the variety. You don't quite know what you're going to catch. It could be a 40 pound fully scaled. It could be a big fat scaleless mirror. It could be a beautiful jet black common. I like that. I like that not knowing what's going to be next. It's exciting. It makes it exciting. And there's actually quite a high proportion of big fish. You know, out of my first five bites I'd had, well, they were all, they were all 30 pluses apart from one. So yeah, it was really good average size. And not just the size of them that's important to me, the fact that they're as old as the hills, a lot of them, you know, proper history fish, catch them while you can, you know, because they're not going to be around forever. And that was quite important to me when I started. I didn't want to catch every fish in the lake. Well, I, I did want to catch every fish in the lake, but really I wanted to catch a couple of those old ones. They, they were the ones that really mattered to me. So having caught a couple quite early on, took the pressure off a little bit, you know. You always question yourself with this type of fishing. Am I good enough? Am I doing the right thing? Three nights in and not having caught one and knowing that they've been the odd bite, you know, it does make you question yourself, even when you have confidence in what you're doing. So maybe it's a little bit of a lesson just to stick, stick with it, stick with it, it'll come to you. And it did. I knew the clock was ticking on my spring campaign. Spawning was imminent, the weather was warming up. Across the country, the carp were starting to spawn. And five and six isn't actually that deep. Out of all the lakes on the complex, it's the one where they spawn first. So I was really, really keen to get back and take advantage. Now, the following week, again, I would have loved to come back and done three nights, you know, the maximum of an hour, but I just didn't have that time. I had other things going on and I could do a 36 hour session. So I turned up in the evening, and John Button was already here. He'd actually found the fish that I'd found the previous week in the corner and was fishing for them. So I had a little social with him. We had a barbecue and I sat up nearby and in the evening he actually caught one. Um, so I was really, really pleased for him. Come the following morning, it was actually dead in front of me. There was nothing to be seen. You know, the scene of previous weeks, multiple takes, couldn't really see any carp. So I was back on the barrow by nine o'clock uh, and lapping the lake. Um, by lunchtime, I'd done three laps, I think, and spent loads of time looking and hadn't really seen anything. There was nothing in the channels, there was nothing visible, there was nothing bubbling, there was nothing jumping. So I decided to just pop over to Lake 8 and have a change of scene. And I went over there and sat in a corner with one rod out. But the whole time that I was there, I was just thinking about five and six. You know, it's kind of really got under my skin and I, I knew that clock was ticking and I had to get back over there. So in between the heavy showers, I headed back round did another couple of laps and then the sun came out and as I was looking up Lake 5 a back broke the surface just sort of quite close to the far margin but that was the only thing that I'd seen all day and that was the only sign that I needed you know I, I kind of had earmarked that area as being one that I should keep an eye on and I didn't waste any time you know I knew where I needed to be fishing got around there real quick with the barra set up the pole and I pulled my rigs out now it's really odd isn't it um, you get so used to getting quick bites with the pole that I'd been fishing 20 minutes and I'd not caught one and I was getting itchy feet already, you know, and that might sound really bizarre, but especially on a place like the Woolpack, which isn't, no, you know, it's notoriously tricky, you know, the fish, they know when they're being fished for. But 20 minutes in and I was sort of getting itchy feet, so I wandered into the swim next door to have a little look, see if I could see anything up the lake where I was fishing the, it's quite tight and you, you can't really see lots of water. So with not much sort of visible in front of me, I was keen just to see what was going on. Anyway, I had a single bleep, which sort of pricked, pricked my ears up, you know. Single bleeps, are, they do happen as the lines tighten up. And then I had another one and that instantly, I was hot footing it back into the swim. And as I walked into the swim, the bobbin was tight in the alarm. You know, I was fishing fairly locked up anyway. Lifted the rod, bent into the fish and it was game on, you know. I had one, it had been about 25 minutes after spending all morning looking it actually hadn't taken long to hook one when I'd found them. It was a bit of a fraught battle because the fish kited up the lake and in front of this swim, there's actually thick reed beds that extend either side. And as it kited, the line was coming over the top of the reeds and I'm thinking, oh, how am I gonna, how am I gonna get it through? And I was halfway through kicking my shoes off and rolling my trousers up to wade round when it actually kited back and pinged off the reeds in front of me. And luckily I managed to net it at first attempt. And it was a really nice one, a mid 30 mirror. Absolutely like, after seeing nothing to having one in the net 25 minutes later. <sighs> yeah, it's, it's funny how fishing is. Um, just, I'm buzzing thinking about it now. Um, so I phoned Dan up who lives just around the corner. 
and he was going to come and film it. I made a cup of coffee, I sat down, took a couple of swigs and then I thought to myself, well, really, he's going to be half an hour, I should get that rod back out. So I did. I, I got it back out, pulled it back out on the spot, exactly the same spot. And as I was shipping the pole back in, I glanced down to see the line peeling off the spool of my reel. I stopped shipping just for a second and the line carried on peeling and it's happened to me before. It was a bite straight away, I hadn't even closed the bail arm. Um, threw the pole down, picked the rod up, bent into it, heavy resistance. And then this fish just kited up the lake at speed. And I knew I'd hooked a good one at that point with one in the net already. And just as the fish popped up ready for netting, thankfully Ollie and Dan arrived and I had a little bit of help because it would have been a little bit fraught with a, a mid 30 that I'd already unhooked in the net and this other one coming to the net and Ollie did an expert job of guiding both in safely and I was blown away man. I, I looked down into the net and I've got 75 odd pounds worth of carp, a significant brace of carp, a really nice one with scales on the side and then one which wasn't just scaly, it was fully scaled, jet black, awesome, you know, one of the ones that I was there to catch. There's three big fully scales in the wool pack and I had one of them in my net. That is 33, just over 33, 33.4, 33 33.2. I think one of the reasons that the bites come so quickly is fishing a bright pop-up because the fish come along and it's one of the first things that they eat. So quite often there's still bait left once you've hooked them. 20 minute bite. But believe it or not, that wasn't the quickest bite today. <laughs> Amazing. Really nice carp. And I think that was what happened in this case, is that I'd hooked that first fish just as it started feeding on the spot, and the second fish was feeding on what was left. So I literally dropped it on top of its head as it was already feeding. Um, yeah, you don't get that casting, do you? You know, it's the, the bushwhacker is a, a massive, massive advantage in these situations. Just being able to drop it stealthily, and the fish don't really know that they're being fished for. So on the wall pack, not casting for me has been one of my biggest edges and it's certainly led to a lot of quick bites. I think about a third of my bites have come within 10 minutes of dropping the rig now. So you, you wouldn't really expect it on a tricky lake, but here we go. The last one was a, was a lovely carp, really nice carp and a big one as well, 33 pounds. But uh, this one's a bit special, this is one of the fish it was really high on the list of, uh, of fish to catch out of the wall pack here. A very, very awesome fully scaled. Definitely going to be a PB fully scaled for me, this. Maybe over 40 pounds. It is. just a touch under 40, it's like 39, it's shaking a little bit. It's like bang on 40, let's see now it's over 40. It's just over 40 pounds, just over, it's 40 pound four. <laughs> it's not about the weight though with this one. This is a really old one and what an incredible carp. Well, this is what I've come to Woolpack for, for one of these amazing old carp. And you know what? It's the quickest bite of the lot. I hadn't even closed the bail arm on the rod that I've just pulled out. You know, this is a notoriously tricky pit, but if you can sneak up on them, you can catch them really, really quickly. Oh man, what an afternoon.